Thank you. Can, can you hear me okay? Good. Okay. I do. Yeah. So uh, I just want to thank the organizers. And um, we came down last night. And it, okay. okay. How's that? Any better? Not much? How about this? Okay. So <clears throat> you see the, the first slide here talks about Down East Maine being the last best hope. And in the fine print, of course, it's, uh, can, it, can you read the fine print from the back? <laughs> it's a wicked piss off. And Eastern Maine is what we say is the last best hope for, our, for the diadromous sweet. So the diadromous sweet are those fish that migrate in and out of the rivers. Um, to spawn, and the eel is the only one that migrates in the reverse direction, of course, to spawn in the ocean. And we say it's the last best hope, partly because of the landscape that it exists within. So this is an aquatic landscape we're talking about. It's great to be here, kind of the theme being aquatics. Um, as a fisheries guy, um, I pe say people suffer from terrestrialism. And <laughs> we, I want to, I'd asked the question earlier about the why Obama hadn't maybe passed that legislation. And I just wanted to ask the question, anyone in the room have a commercial fishing license? Anyone ever been a commercial fisher person? Any fam anyone whose family was in commercial fishing? A few. Commercial farming? How many are commercial farmers now make the majority of your living farming? How about your families in the past? A lot of people. Not that many commercial fishing families in the past, and I think that that's an important thing here in the, the Gulf of Maine, to understand <clears throat> really the, the mechanics of commercial fishing and the, the history and the heritage and all of that. And in eastern Maine, where, where I live and where I work, um, east of the Penobscot and to the Canadian border, so essentially um, what Hancock and Washington County is the easternmost county in, in uh, the United States, so-called uh, Sunrise County. <clears throat> it's the highest density of commercial fishermen anywhere on the east coast of, of the United States. Um, yet we're still importing most of our, our fish into Maine from elsewhere, something like 90% of the fish. So we're living in what we call a lobster bubble right now. And the economy is highly dependent on one species. And the work that we're doing with Atlantic salmon as an umbrella species is helping to protect and restore what we feel are um, a whole diversity of species, most importantly the, the uh, native sea run fish, but then also the, the uh, spin-offs of that, which were mentioned earlier, and that's the cod, which of course uh, Massachusetts is so famous for. But when we think about um, what's left, we have to think about the landscape and with, in the case of Atlantic salmon, which is now an endangered species, and I work for the Downey Salmon Federation, we're a local group. Um, we are membership based and we originated about 30 so years ago from anglers who had wanted to do more to restore salmon to our rivers. So this is the Machias River watershed and this is probably the last best hope for Atlantic salmon to stabilize the populations and then and there are other surrounding rivers as well. But this is the biggest of the, of the so-called down east salmon rivers. So it's uh, essentially undammed. And I'll show another slide in a moment or later in the presentation. But the yellow and the orange are the spawning and nursery areas. So these, these are the, some of the tools that we're using to understand where the fish go, what, they're, what they need. And then we work within this landscape um, to do restoration activities one by one with small landowners and very, very large landowners. So Downey Salmon Federation started by salmon anglers way back when, some pretty pictures, what salmon can do. They can jump 10 feet straight out of the air. They're the king of freshwater game fish. So one of these um, very popular species. It's also with some very unpopular. So it's, this is um, also referred to as the spotted owl of the east. And what they need to survive is clean conditions, um, intact habitats. These are some scenes from Down East. That's Tunk Mountain, 
right on the wa uh, watershed divide between a number of watersheds. Atlantic salmon habitat, coal, riffly water, good riparian buffers. Uh, this isn't what it all looks like up in Maine, and I'll, I'll tell you some stories. If the picture on the bottom left is interesting because that one is probably um, highly altered and altered by log drives. Here you see logs up on the bank still from historic log drives. This is one of our board members who started fishing at an early age. He's now in his uh, late 60s, 14 pound salmon from the East Machias River. He was 14 years old. And a little bit about um, what, what's gone on. This is sport catches. So the number of fish being caught in sport, it came up quite, quite well in the 80s. Something happened, things turned around and it, and it precipitously dropped. We did begin to release a lot more fish, so there was a lot more uh, consciousness among the anglers about conservation. Um, forage fish, as we mentioned earlier, are a piece of what you see reflected here. So the capelin off of uh, the North Atlantic were, began to be harvested. Sea surface temperatures began to change at that period. But there were a number of other things, commercial fishing, um, dam building. This is just the down east rivers. So you see the numbers of fish that we're talking about. It's in the hundreds really being caught. And then the salmon eventually being listed. So the, the anglers had a choice. Were they going to fight the listing or they were going to become a participant in the restoration? And, and some clubs, there were many salmon fishing clubs, um, chose to go one way or the other. And we were fortunate down east that um, we organized really around conservation and a much more holistic uh, vision of what we could be doing for the rivers as a whole, for the community, for the fishing um, industry. Uh, I also should mention that, that this section of Maine is also, it's extremely wet. So there's a lot of fish um, historically, some still. The highest density of uh, registered Maine guides. So it's not just commercial fishing, it's also angling, recreational type fishing. And we've all seen these types of declines. So river herring are alewives and blueback herring. So it's two, we, the, I see the, uh, you know, the name alewife is used mostly to talk about river herring, but in fact there are two species and they have very different requirements and they're very difficult to tell apart. Shad, which is just an, kind of an overgrown river herring, um, have declined. And of course our cod numbers that you see here. However, there are good, there are good graphs too. So here's a, mo this is a graph from the Tyne heavily industrialized river in northern England and heavily polluted. Um, it was no stocking program, no restoration program until around the point where you see the, this increase. So we've, we've gone looking for examples of success and this graph has continued to go up and then leveled off a little bit. So how did they do it there? Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about that story. So the innovation of of some people there who, who we're trying to learn from. Where we live is, is remote. It's uh, not very developed in the sense there's a lot of, it was paper company land, this massive um, blueberry industry, and then a lot of coastline and a lot of commercial fishing. So the population is very, very low. The resources are, are substantial and relatively intact. So when we say that we want to stabilize what we have and then build out from there, illustrate how it can be done in other places. Um, we're doing this with a very small population. It's one of the poorest counties, uh, Washington County, in eastern North America. It's the oldest, whitest, um, and um, the greatest need in terms of college education. Um, and it's a food desert, and so there's a lot of these statistics that form around this, yet we've, we've found a way to work within the context of all that to develop some things. So we've kind of put it all under one roof. We've developed a land trust, we've developed hatcheries, uh, educational programs, and we've taken, sorry for the quality of that picture, we've, we've taken problems and turned them into solutions, as they say. So this was 
This is the Pleasant River, and this is a hatchery that was developed out of a hydroelectric dam that had prevented fish from migrating up. This was built during Carter's time when there was energy crisis, fast track permits, and a little corporation came in and built this. And this was what really coalesced the Salmon Federation, was fighting to prevent this dam from being built on one of the last wild salmon rivers in eastern North America. So I'm forgetting the biology of Atlantic salmon, just assuming that you all know, but there are two years in the river and two years out in the ocean, and they come back and they spawn in their native natal river, often to the very same place where they were born. So not just the river itself, but the tributary. So they're genetically distinct stocks, river to river. This has all been looked at um, very thoroughly. So the Pleasant River stock was at jeopardy here, and ultimately there was a, uh, a restoration project. So this was our first restoration project back in 1990. Um, taking out this dam which we had fought initially to prevent from being built. So hydroelectricity, like other forms of generation of power, um, can have its problems. Goals of our center, of course, is to include the community. And how do we do this and, and what's the purpose, overarching purpose? Multi-species, watershed-wide, and this word co-management um, I think is really important because without the community involved, without the commercial fishermen involved, so when we think about Stellwagen Bank and what, how did we get to where we are, we've got to be thinking about bringing in the parties that are really um, um, stakeholders, and very, very important stakeholders. So here's an example of, of the lack of sort of focused commitment toward a natural resource. The fishway on the left is, the same, is what preceded what we did here. So we rebuilt this fishway, which was one of the biggest runs, or is one of the biggest runs of river herring left in all of North America. So <clears throat> a few years ago, we discovered that the uh, state of Maine doesn't really have the money to do what they should be doing. They, that was owned by the state of Maine. We raised the money through a coalition and rebuilt the, the fishway. Now we're putting... Uh, monitoring devices in there so that we can monitor how many fish are moving through. So that's the citizen science part of this. And this is remote. This is a town with about 200 people. You, it's way down a dirt road. Um, <clears throat> no one uses fax. Some of the people, they're not using email. We have to physically drive there, meet with the select boards, and, and, um, and recruit volunteers from, those, from that population. So here's another interesting story. This is, um, we talk about biodiversity and the, and the cover of the, um, the program today shows all of the beautiful sea anemones and there's one place in Maine that's known for its, its, bio, its the most biodiverse estuary, I think on the east coast of the United States and that's Cobscook Bay. Biodiverse in terms of uh, invertebrate populations. Yet the tributaries to that bay are being um, left in this state of affairs. So this is what the Passamaquoddy is called the Cobscook River. It's now called the Orange River. And the dam right at the head of tide was abandoned about 60 years ago. And we've been negotiating for about 20 years with the dam owner who had believed that this, this dam was going to eventually be a big windfall because someone would buy it to generate electricity. And he'd had a lot of people looking at it over many, many years. Finally, um, we've convinced him that that's not very viable and we've had some engineers to come in and, and lay out some numbers around that. And on Friday, we're going to buy this. So we're raising the money. <laughs> so everyone who applauded gets to contribute. And there's the, <laughs> remember where we're coming from here. So. <clears throat> We're down here also recruiting membership and encouraging you to think about the landscape that is part of New England and part of your Yankee heritage if you're a Yankee. Um, and we have numerous of these. And the state of Massachusetts has about 3,000 deadbeat dams. So, <clears throat> and Maine has about 2,000. This one's 18 feet tall and it's right at the head of time. 
and we have all the historic records going way back that show that there were salmon, shad, alewives, river herring, eels, tom cod, smelt, sea run brook trout, mm, no sturgeon in this case, but uh, being a smaller river. And they're not there now. And this is a faucet that we can turn back on. This is carbon sink, like no other carbon sink that you can think of, I believe. A friend of mine just wrote a paper that's being published uh, in a journal, scientific journal, about the cod being the biggest decimation of biomass ever on this continent, so in terms of animalia. And I think that turning that faucet back on, putting those cod back where they are, means you have to feed them, and the river herring are a big part of that. So this dam um, is going to cost us $125 thousand dollars to buy the dam and the associated rundown house right in the middle of this gorgeous little village and then we have to work with everyone who learned how to swim in the mill pond and uh, the people who have their kayaks and their water slides and and the um, fire department and the fire chief just happens to own the other house over there and they they need the water for firefighting so there's a lot of bits and pieces of working with the community in order to get to the point where we're going to either build a fishway or we're going to um, take the dam out. And so that's the next stage of the story. And we're not saying just where that's all headed yet. But there are some other dams in the watershed. So this is the Orange River watershed and the production capacity. So we've got it right down to the number of eggs that we would anticipate coming from the river herring. So this is just river herring. That's not the other fish. The sea lamprey is the other one that I forgot. Um, a lot of nutrient cycling back and forth. And if the salmon are an umbrella species, meaning you protect the salmon, if you can protect salmon and restore salmon, you're probably going to restore a lot of other fish underneath of it or a lot of other organisms and ecosystem function. However, with alewives, we talk of them as a keystone species. Keystone meaning when you yank them out, everything collapses around that is supported by them. So we're put, trying to put a keystone back in as well as put this umbrella over the whole thing um, all before the bubble burst. So the lobster bubble is what the economy is largely driven from and we don't think that's gonna stick around forever. So we're trying to build diversity into our um, fisheries. So these numbers in the billions are impressive. A quarter of a million alewives produced each year in and out of that watershed itself. Um, is substantial. This is um, conserved lands within the Machias River watershed. When you think about Eastern Maine and the fact that most of these unorganized townships, they don't have names, they're numbers. T, T25MD and, and so, and that's six by six square miles and there's about seven or eight of them represented across this landscape. And then you've got the town of Centerville which just um, deorganized a few years ago because there were so few people there that it went back to an unorganized territory. There's an opportunity to work with one landowner, International Paper in that case, and in partnership with us as the local entity, we work with the Nature Conservancy and protected 76 miles of river frontage, 1,000 feet both sides. That river is protected as wild forever. So if you think of the Allagash, you think of the St. John, this is now what we have in Eastern Maine on one of the best salmon rivers. The next river is the East Machias River. This is where Pope and Talbot took got their feet under them before they took their sawmill and sailed off to the Pacific Northwest. So the Pope and Talbot Mill was here. Um, and you see there's a fish passage built here. And you probably have all studied the Magna Carta inside and out. And you know that the Magna Carta um, also had a, a stipulation that if thou builds a dam, thou will build a fishway sufficient to move a, a mature sow through it. Well, so we've known that fishways are, are required. I'm getting the three minute signal here. Oh, it's not advancing as soon as you did that. Okay. So, and then another dam was built, but this fishway you notice is kind of high and dry. This is a Bangor hydroelectric dam built in the 20s. Um, this is what we did to it in the 90s after it had been abandoned. This was the associated building that they eventually gave us after we offered them a, a dollar for it. Um, 
and it had pigeons flying in and out of it and rats and so on. This is what it looks like now. Um, we've disguised it as a Grange Hall, but inside is a hatchery that is uh, a replica of an innovative hatchery on the Tyne River. So in this case, we're, <clears throat> we're simulating or um, nature in the sense that a per person on the Tyne had developed a, a method. Okay, I'm gonna skip through a couple of these other slides, some other dams that we're hoping to buy or give, get given. And, um, no, I guess I've got a slide further in. But I just wanted to say that um, the innovation that we're using with this method on the East Machias is built around um, simulating the natural um, ecosystem in which the fish live. So the dark tanks, rapid flowing water, and very different. So we're trying to fix the fish at the same time that we're fixing the river. And we're working with um, the communities to help people get engaged. So here we, we're putting some fish in a smokehouse. These are alewives. Historically, of course, they were alewives being, they were in our food system, local food. Um, they were sent off to Jamaica and other places where the slaves were fed alewives because they were so abundant and cheap and the rum was brought back, part of our glorious history. Um, and so now we have a mobile smokehouse that's on wheels and we go town to town talking to people about restoring our rivers for local food purposes of local food. My presentation is longer than the time I have, but one species that I want to speak about is this, this one here, which in Boston Harbor were harvested by the millions of pounds, um, by multiple, many, many fishermen and people just going out individually and, and catching them. Well, the last, again, remnant population of these is really down, down East Maine. They're very, uh, they need cold water and we think that's part of the reason, but they also need good habitat without sedimentation and so on. Um, declines, some genetics. But this is our citizen science smelt stream survey work. Over 100 streams that we've been going to visit over time and identifying healthy populations and identifying opportunities for restoration. So we know of three brooks called Smelt Brook in this, in this uh, region all of which are dammed up and have no smelts in them right now. However, there are some success stories, and this is, is one. This is the best smelt brook left in probably North America on this East Coast. Little tiny thing, but it, it is just absolutely packed with smelts. And now we own that. So our land trust purchased the property all around the critical habitat there, and we're hoping to do the same thing stream by stream. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you.